We're going to be talking about uh, the actual title is t called 10%. Now, why do you think I would title a less than 10%? Anybody got any ideas? That's exactly it. <laughs> only 10% of the people that we baptize, including our children, stay faithful. We've got a problem. You know, we've got a leadership problem. We have an evangelism problem. But we don't solve this problem. You can evangelize all the people in your town and you're not going to keep them. And so uh, I'm filling in for uh, the fellow who's supposed to be here and he was going to give you 10 ways not to go out and evangelize, I guess. I don't know what they were, but <laughs> 10 ways you can get sued or something, but legal things, you know. But... but uh, you know, I've got a million dollar policy, so I don't care you know, if I get sued or not. <laughs> and I was able, you know, preachers can't get that anymore. They can't get that kind of protection. I, I kind of slipped under the wire with Allstate, and I'm not letting it go. <laughs> so, so how to keep an, a mature new Christians? Well, we talk about 10% of the, uh, of the people that stay with it. And... Uh, how can we get it up more? I, uh, I worked as an outreach minister before we started with Home Mission for eight and a half years. And we had a baptism or a restoration average every week for over eight years. And we were bound and determined we were going to come up with, with materials and ways to keep these new Christians. And we came up with several ways. We kept 60% of the people that were baptized. Now that that is a, that's unheard of usually in a congregation, especially if you have campaigns and stuff like that. It's real hard to keep the if you get if you keep forty percent in a campaign, you're doing really good, you're doing really good. Uh, but you're going to have to be ready for them. So why do new Christians fall away? I think that's the question we have to ask. Well, in 2 Timothy 2 and 10, Paul was pretty depressed. <laughs> that was probably the last letter, that's the last letter we have that he wrote. And he said, be diligent to come to me quickly. Diligent, quickly. What does that say to you? Come now. Yeah, it's urgent. I need you, Timothy. For Demas has... What has he done? First thing he did was he forsook him. What does it mean to forsake somebody? Skipped out on a job. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Ran away. Left him. And what else did Demas do? Why did he forsake him? Because he loved this present world. That's, and then he departed. The word departed means to cross over. I mean, Demas was, he was right with Paul. He was mentioned as being with Paul in another book. He was right there. But now he crossed over and went back into the world. That broke Paul's heart. And that's what happens to a lot of our new Christians. They come in and they're so excited. Of course, we have the parable of the, of the, the uh, soils. And uh, we understand that one, only one out of four made it. You know, because of the only one out of four got a deep root plant and stayed with it. But a lot of people leave. They forsake the Lord they get involved in the present world and they cross over back into it. And there's some reasons that they do that that we're going to talk about in a minute. We've got to stop this. We've got to watch it. We've got to be careful. We don't need to smother these new Christians. We don't need to dump a whole bunch of stuff on them at once. But we need to patiently and lovingly be with them. What does Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 say? Brethren, if anyone is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a man in the spirit of gentleness, 
considering yourself. That could have been me falling away. If I hadn't had good strong parents when I was baptized who taught me the way, and even after that, I needed great mentors in the church to help me. So these are the things that happen to new Christians. And then here's the one that really, really was the downer for Paul. He said, goes on in 2 Timothy 4 and says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. Do you feel like when a new Christian falls away that you studied with, that they've forsaken you? That they're not standing with you? Do you feel like you've, you've lost a, good, a dear friend? I mean, you sat there and studied with them and brought them to Christ, and, and now they're gone. And you just say, what happened? I studied with a lot of people that, were, that God brought to Himself. And God gives the increase, not me. I'm no one. But God, the, these people, you work and work and work with them, and then one of them will tell me, well, I don't have a job. They'll say, well, we're going to pray that you get a job. Well, God gives them a job. And the next thing you know, they're selling Amway. And then the next thing you know, they got a third job. And so there's nothing wrong with selling Amway, but what I mean is, is that they're, they've got three jobs now and they're having to work on Sundays and they don't have time for God. And God bailed them out in the first place because He redeemed their soul. And so you talk to them and say, are you going to forsake? You know, can you get by and live on what you've got? Or, or can, are you going to depend upon God to help you to get to a point to where you can financially and stably be there and be worshipped with the saints every Sunday. And that's a decision that they have to make. But I tell you what, and sometimes our new Christians feel that way too. You know, I don't know how many times I've seen youth uh, come and uh, from a family that was baptized in Christ and the youth will go there and here's our other youth they don't talk to them. They're talking to themselves. They're left out. Do you think that gal in that picture feels like she, no one stood with her? That she was forsaken? My mother, God bless her, had bipolar before they identified bipolar. And she took, uh, oh, stuff like uh, downers. Uh, they would give her tranquilizers and stuff like that. Well, that's like throwing, you know, gasoline on a fire. No one knew how to deal with that growing up. But my mother loved the Lord with all her heart. And she would tell me, you see that young man over there? You go over and sit by him. Or that young woman over here that's come in from this family, you go and talk to them. Or this young man that's come in here and he's by himself. You go make a friend of him. You go look for the little guy. The people that's standing alone. Do you know what her favorite song was? And we sang it before she died. All of our family got in there and sang it. Where no, <laughs> excuse me, where no one stands alone. <laughs> man, I'm telling you. And she said, told me, she said, you need to be in a, when you, if you're working in a church, you need to be the church of where no one sits alone. Where no one sits alone. Mm, sorry about that. So, what does a new Christian need? What do you think they need? What are, what are some suggestions you have? What's that? Engaged, yes. If you, Sir? Loved. Loved, yeah. How long? An hour? From now on, From now on okay. What else? Encouragement. Encouragement. Oh, yeah. Big time. They need to be taught. Exactly. Patience. Patience. 
Well, a new, when a new Christian comes in, a lot of times they're, they're coming from a broken world. And we think they ought to be financially secure, healthy. They can just fit right in and go, and they don't have any problems. And they've got all their doctrine straightened out. Exactly, exactly. They need the milk. They need a job to do. They need involvement. Exactly. Now these are some of the things that we recognize, but do we really do them in our churches? And that's our problem. If we don't, I fear God's going to hold us accountable for that. Well, They need personal one-on-one study. Now, I know a lot of people that will have a rash of baptisms or maybe even two or three baptisms and they'll have a class for them. That's okay if that's all you can do, but what's what's the good and the bad of just having a class for the new Christians? Yeah, Yeah, they might be intimidated to ask questions. Come on in. And uh, what else? Could isolate them from the rest of the flock. Yeah, could isolate them. Would would having a and, and a lot of times they'll miss classes, so they miss what you're talking about. And so, uh, you know, you you need you need to be able to have something to where you can have. One-on-one attention. That's the best thing to do, right? But what's it going to take to have personal one-on-one study with new Christians? What's the first thing that has to happen? You have to have somebody willing to do it. We need to train our members to be able to study with new Christians and to work with them. Do you know that statistically, and this could be very different ways, but people who have examined this say that about 90% of the church people in all the churches have never held an organized Bible study with anybody. 90%. I don't know how many people tell me, well, if they'll come to church all the time, they'll get all that they need. No, they don't get all that they need. And uh, especially if they have crying babies or kids that can't sit still. You know, uh, it's a tough go. I heard of one one lady that brought her kid to church and he was acting up. He was wild. He had ADD plus and all whatever. And and, uh, he was acting up and and the preacher got up there and started preaching. He couldn't sit still, so she reached over and whispered something into his ear. And he straightened up like a stone statue. So after the church was over, a couple of ladies that saw that, they came up and said, what did you tell that boy to get him to straighten up? She said, I just whispered in his ear that if she disturbs the preacher one more time, he's going to stop his sermon and start all over again. (laughs) It worked. (laughs) They need at least six lasting friends. Not just people that go say, you know, have you ever, you ever seen people that they go and shake hands with you? And they want to, you know, the six foot distancing. Hello, how are you? Oh. <laughs> I could use a hug. You don't have them give them a full bodied hug, but just go up and, you know, and uh, pat them on the back like that. Uh, do something that's that's not going to cause problems. Uh, if you shake their hands, that's great, you know. But make sure it's a good, uh, good handshake, and and that that you talk to them and smile to them, and that you don't gripe about the elders. That's the last thing you want to do is start griping about the elders or some of the members or some of the problems you have going on in the church. They don't want. They don't need to hear that. I had one guy, one time. There was a Catholic priest and he was converted. And he went back there and he was 
talking to this woman that was not a member of the church, but he was talking to her about Christ, what he had learned. And her ex-husband uh, was a member there, and he was crazy. He wasn't a member there very long. He comes up to him and he said, you talk to my wife again, I'm going to kill you. Well, they were divorced. <laughs> yeah. And then he had some other problems with people, and then he quit. And then he tried another church of Christ, and they wouldn't fool with it. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. By the way, who is your wife now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, who is your wife now? I mean, it's just, this poor guy, I still keep in touch with him some. But he, sir? The priest. No, the other guy, no. Oh, I, I could, I'm not even going to get into what he did, but um, no, I don't. Uh, and I'm not, I don't even live in the same town he lived in, so. But they need six lasting friends. Um, Matthew Maureen talked in our uh, Revive Alabama that we had this year at, at Heritage in June, middle of June. He talked about group evangelism and how that he, he used a um, one of those little Legos and he showed how you attach people to your Lego and you're attached to your little group of four or five and you bring them in and maybe one person is good at making food and taking to them and one person is good at, at, at Bible study and one person is good at uh, maybe inviting them to a social function and then another person is good at but he says he says personal evangelism is okay but but he said group evangelism is more uh, is working more especially and this guy's he's like in his 30s and he has his doctorate degree and he uses words that I have to think about for a minute but it's, they talk a different language than I do you know, I, I, I'm just a little boy that used to work on a hog farm <laughs> and, and uh, uh, sell cakes for Rainbow and all that kind of stuff and, until I went to preaching school. But uh, um, but man, what a cl powerful class it was. And their church has just grown exponentially. They're in Colorado. And they had just grown and grown and grown and grown because people come in and they take they hitch their Lego to one of theirs and then to the other the other Legos. I mean that's if you see what I mean. And that's how they do evangelism and that's how they keep new Christians. A congregation that is trained. I want you to know that home mission that I work for, we have a lot of materials that we give to churches free, free of charge. We like to do a workshop with him first. And back there on the back is a man named Jim Lucas, who, who if you would like a workshop in your church congregation and to begin the journey, then talk to Jim and he will help you. Uh, he will set you up, one of our evangelists, to come by and do it. And uh, it's just like a Sunday through a Wednesday workshop. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. And it's... Um, and our idea is to get the church healthy, going in the same direction, talking about what they want to do. We don't come in and tell them what to do. We let them tell us what they want to do. And we put it together for them. Then we help them to meet goals. And then we work towards uh, where that they can start building up their body there. And one of the things we teach them is a book that I'm going to give all of you before you leave today. Uh, but we're going to come out with a book pretty soon that's a quarterly. I know that's an old-fashioned word, but it's a quarterly on how to keep new Christians, and it's training the congregation to work with new Christians. I, you know, I know a lot of the, the classes that we teach on Wednesday night and Sunday morning, stuff like that, are books of the Bible, and that's great. That's wonderful. But sometimes we need to have some of these classes that teach us how to do things. And one of the things that the whole church needs to know to do is how to keep and mature new Christians. And we have a quarterly that's coming out that will be free pretty soon. And uh, we'll be advertising it. And then, 
voluntary involvement is what you want out of them. You mentioned, one of y'all mentioned that they need to get involved. But you don't need to force them. You don't need to put a round peg in a square hole. You need to ask them, what do you like to do? What would you like to do for Jesus? And let them talk about some things. They may say, well, I really don't know what to do because I'm, I'm new here and everything. And so, let me tell you, you look around and you see where you can fit in and what you can do. And the first thing you can do is, is, um, is, is you, can, you can tell me about all the people in your circle of influence. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But they can get started right then. You know, our best evangelists can be our new Christians because they have a whole different circle of influence than we do. And then they need to evangelize. Well, I just mentioned. They need to evangelize and, and their circle of influence because their circle of influence is greater than, than what you can reach. You know, you, you baptize a, a woman and she's a mother. Well, she has kids. And sometimes she has a husband. And, so, and she has maybe a sister, some aunts and uncles and things of this sort. And you get her to write it down. And um, I'm going to pass this. Um, I've got a couple of... Uh, Jim, could you help me with that, please? I've got a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, clipboards in the back and some pens. If you would like some more information on some of this material, even if you don't want us to come and do a workshop, we can share with you some of this material. And one of them is this little bitty card. Uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But, but this is what you use to help them get started. Then you want to keep them on this track, the Acts 2.42 track. They need to continue steadfastly in what? Apostles' Doctrine. Fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And what happened when the disciples did that on a daily basis? People were baptized on a daily basis, and the Lord added to the Lord to the church daily, daily, such as should be saved. The the closer we get back to this model and the follow that model, the more we're going to grow. We've got some churches now that are following that model, and I mean, they're busting out of the seams. We're having to work with four churches on how to uh, how to find more seating, so they don't have to go out and build, uh, spend four million dollars on a new building. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> you know, that's I mean, you know, the first thought was, well, let's go to two church, two services. Well, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And so we're giving them ideas how they can get more seats. Isn't that a wonderful problem to have? Wouldn't you like to have that in your congregation? Some of you may have that problem. We need to, we need to, we need to let God grow our churches. And that's the pattern that he used right there. Acts 2, 42 through 47. Uh, and again, <laughs> what does the church need to do? We need to train our members to hold studies. Okay, uh, Jim, Danny, could you help me pass these out, please? The Spanish ones are right over there. Yeah, any of y'all want a Spanish one? We have them in English and in Spanish. Some of these are teacher's editions. Some of them are student editions. Here's some students here. Uh, now let me let me explain. Uh, by the way, when they're drip drying after they get out of the baptistry, you want to set up a study with them immediately. When can we meet again? If you don't do that. Chances are they may not even come to church Sunday. Anybody else need a Spanish one? Um, you, you, need, you need to be able to set up a study and continue it. And the reason we did foundations, this is 30 years worth of work. 
as a preacher, outreach minister, and then home mission, and working with gospel sharing to put it together. That's why it's called Foundations for Disciples After Care. So the way this thing works is, is that um, you can see on the table of contents all the different things that we do or talk about. They're basic things. Actually, we, we encourage the entire congregation to go through this. Just to spend a couple of quarters and go through this. And maybe after every three lessons, then practice on each other. One of the lessons. Get used to teaching it. If you don't get the congregation to practice, you ought to have just a quarter just practicing going through this with some with each other. <clears throat> Remember, 90% of, of most members of the church have never held an organized Bible study. If you get in there and just start running off at the mouth and going all over the place, especially without a Bible, you're going to confuse these new Christians. They need something organized that they can go to and learn one week at a time. Well, the first lesson has a part in there uh, on page three where they they kind of go back over their conversion because when you convert when they were baptized you want to make sure that they understood what they were doing and if they didn't understand what they were doing they may feel like the need to to do it again you don't make that decision for them you let them make because that's between them and God. Now look on page four. At the end of every lesson is a get involved section. Uh, the first thing is, is make time for Bible study every day. Start out by reading a chapter a day. Start with Genesis or Matthew, whichever one they want to do. And even if the reading is difficult, like genealogies, look for something that catches your attention. Underline it, highlight it, put a wow by it, or place a question mark by it. Don't be afraid to make notes in your Bible. Ask questions or do your own research. Also, listen to the Bible online. Not just study a chapter a day. Listen to it. Find you a good, uh, a good. Uh, what do you? What app do you use? This is my wife, by the way. U version. Little Brown Bible. Holy Bible. And you can get all kind of different versions of it, like 20 or 30 different ones. Now, five years ago, my son bought me a Wonder Bible. I love my Wonder Bible. The Wonder Bible looks like a, one of those old uh, cassette players, the little ones, you know. Or let's go back before that, the transistor radios. Y'all remember those? <laughs> and you just press a button and it plays. But they have 25 actors. And you can download the Wonder Bible for free, but it's got all the music and the background noises and everything else to go with it. And sometimes they don't matter. It's really distracting to me. But the Wonder Bible is just these 25 actors reading different parts in the Bible. It is so good. Sometimes I'll sit there and listen to it for an hour when I could have been watching politics for an hour. Wow. <laughs> what? I mean, I get so interested. And I, I've probably been through the Bible at least five or six or ten times, I don't know, since 2019. And I just learned stuff new. Every day. And I, I love the voice of Moses. And I love the voice of Jesus. And the voice of God is scary. He's a Scottish actor. <laughs> and so uh, it just, I, I love, it costs about 30 bucks. But if you buy two more, then it's half price. I'm, I'm not trying to sell them. We don't sell anything. But, but you might look at the Wonder Bible. This Christmas, if I, if I get after it, we're going to buy a Wonder Bible for all our kids and grandkids. And uh, Because I want them to be able to carry it around with them, and I want them to listen to that. And that is just a, that's a phenomenal... Uh, You'll recognize some of the actors. There's an actress that uh, played uh, the cartoon version of the bad woman, uh, the octopus on Little Mermaid. Y'all remember her voice? Well, she lends her voice to a couple of things, you know. So, uh, and you'll recognize it. And uh, 
anyway, um, but uh, every section has to get involved. And you're trying to get them gradually involved and not force them into doing anything. The first thing, uh, uh, now this has two sections that new Christians, two questions that new Christians always ask. Why don't you, what about miracles? Do we still have miracles today? Well, the section on the Holy Spirit talks about uh the, the timeline on miracles uh, from Joel chapter 2. That the miracles ended at, uh, at the destruction of Jerusalem primarily. And we can prove it. And Joel predicted that. And then on page 29 we have a new song because the second question is why don't you have music or instruments? Yeah. They say music. I get mad when they say that. Anyway, <laughs> we make the sweetest music of all. And look at page. Uh, so this tells why we sing a cappella. And I really harp, we really harp on the two instruments that God gave us to use: our heart. And look on page thirty-five. There's your construction of the larynx, your voice box. And what does that look like? That looks like a stringed instrument, doesn't it? Because that's exactly what it is. It vibrates, and that's how you sing and talk and so on. And God gave you that. And He wants, you, he wants to listen to you, even if you sound like Jeremiah the bullfrog. He wants to listen to exactly what you, you worshiping Him and to heaven it sounds like harpists playing on their harps. That's what our singing sounds like to heaven. Now you may say, like L.L. Pinkerton said, our singing would scare the rat rats out of the wall. Well, you forget about L.L. Pinkerton. He went the wrong way. You just sing to, from the bottom of your heart to the top of your lungs. And we do singing workshops too. So, And, and this also has... Um, if you're studying with someone and you get to baptism and let's say they don't respond or they want to think about it some more, a lot of times we just stop the study. That's a big mistake because we've already gone so far with it. Say, well, I know you want to be a good disciple of Jesus Christ, don't you? What are they going to say? No. <laughs> Not after two or three or four lessons. No, they're going to say, yes, I want to be one. Well, let's just keep studying. And we have this book called Foundations for Disciples. And so you just go right on into this. And I've never seen anyone, including Catholics, Mormons, and even Jehovah Witnesses, that have gone past the fourth lesson without being baptized. If they'll stay with you all the way to the fourth lesson, they'll, they'll obey the gospel. And since we changed up lesson one, most of them will, will obey the gospel. See, they need time to think about it sometimes. We try to force them into the water. We don't want to do that. Just keep studying with them. And the foundations are set up to where you can do that so that you don't have to give up on somebody that you spent several weeks with preparing them and teaching them and befriending them and building a relationship. Also, uh, set up that study immediately with the foundations. When can we meet now uh, after you're baptized? Tuesdays or Thursdays? Which, which the, if they're used to studying with you at a certain time, they just keep that time going. Uh, if not, is there, is there a better time that we can meet? Set it up. 10 o'clock? You know, go ahead and, and set up the meeting then. Challenge them. You are a part of the body of Christ. God's representative on earth. You are an ambassador for Him. You have the privilege of working for the Almighty God who created all 8.3 billion people that are alive now on earth. And you can make a difference. Don't rush in to doing everything at once, but begin building and training and growing in Christ. And who knows what God has planned for you already. Already, Psalms 139, what does he say? I, when I formed you in the world womb, I had plans for you. I had plans for you. Now, we don't always stick to the script, but 
God, God's, God has plans for us all. And uh, now also too, teach the church how to keep them. And that's why we talked about that uh, quarterly that's coming out real soon. And this is so important. How many of you, when you have a new Christian, you warn them about Satan? How many of you, when you have new Christians, warn them about Satan? I always, I really started doing that because I'm going to say Satan hates you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, 10. But Jesus came to give you life, and life abundantly. 2 Peter 5 and 8, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking to whom he may devour. Be diligent, be sober, because your enemy, Satan, and believe you me, they'll come back after the second or third lesson and say, boy, you were right about the devil. Man, I lost my job, or my wife has really been on my back, or my my mother disowned me because I became a member of the, of the Lord's church, or you don't know what they're having to go through and what Satan's putting through. Why does, why does God allow Satan to work on them right after baptism? What's that? Boats of their faith. Yeah. What about a seed that falls into the ground? What does it have to what does it have to do? It pushes up through the dirt. Why? So they grow roots. So, God allows Satan to work on them for a time, times and a half a time, according to Revelation 20, so that they will grow those roots. And Satan is mad because you left his thousand year reign, his eternal reign, and you came into Christ into his eternal reign, and you're, you're, uh, and Satan wants you back. And he's going to do everything to get you back. And so you need to tell them, that they, Satan is going to be after them a while. But that's why we have the Spirit of God. And that's why we have the Word of God. And that's why we have our brothers and sisters. Because that's protection against what Satan has to offer. And if they lose their job because Satan calls that, then you go out and get them a better job. See what I mean? Don't just say, well, I'm so sorry. Be ye warm and filled. I'll pray for you. Five minutes. And then warm, and then and then the and then keep working with them, and then if if you want this, we'll mail it to your church, or if you want to do the workshop, this is even better. But this is called the Stars Cards, and uh, it's taken from Daniel twelve and three. Those who win many to righteousness are like the stars in the sky, and we have a list here called My Ten. And one thing you want to get a new Christian to do immediately is to write down ten names of people that they know that they want to bring to Christ. And then you show them what to do. You want to pray for them every day. You want to try to study some with them every day, but don't study with them without a Bible. Uh, I encourage people to use Bible trivia because people, you've got about five or ten sexes with people and that's it <laughs> today. So Bible trivia is a great thing to use to get interest. And then connect with them. On the back is the hopes method where you talk about get to know them. What, where were you born? Where are you from? Where do you live? What's your home? Uh, where were you born? You're trying to make a connection there. Where were you born? Chattanooga. You know, I went there one time. And we went to the Lookout Mountain. And we went to the Fat Man Squeeze. And I got stuff all over my shirt. I had a bigger belly than I have now. So <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Chattanooga. Now that's, that's also by uh, the Lookout Mountains there, right? Okay. And so uh, anyway... Uh, See, I, I made a connection with him. He knows about the fat man squeeze because he's been through it. He's seen the sign. I guess the sign's still up there. It is, uh-huh. And so is the black 
mold on the <laughs> on the rocks. Our son brings it up still to this day, and he was just a little bitty old piper. Uh, and then you talk about occupation. What do you do for a living? What do you do for a living, sir? I produce uh, literature in French for the French-speaking churches. Oh, okay. God bless you. That, that is wonderful. That's wonderful. And so, uh, I don't know much I can connect with him on that, except we oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> Keep doing the good work. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 uh, we are working on getting these into different languages. Uh, so, um, if you want to, we, we use AI. But now, AI in Spanish is about ninety-five percent accurate, but in French, it'd probably be more like sixty-five percent. So you'd have to have somebody go back over it. So if you're interested, we'll be happy to AI it and send it to you. So uh, anyway, and then you can go and, you know, I, we would love to have it in all different languages. And then ask them about uh, their um, H-O-M, uh, H-O-P. What, what are your preferences? What's your favorite place to eat, ma'am? What's your favorite Mexican food place? Um, you, sorry, I don't go there very often. <laughs> do you like Chewy's? I don't actually like Chewy's. You don't like Chewy's? <laughs> Taco Bell? No, it's Cancun. Cancun, okay. Well, I've never eaten there, but I've eaten Mexican foods all over the place, all over the country. I went and ate it out in Philadelphia one time, and they brought me an enchilada, and they had tomato sauce on it. That's nasty. <laughs> they shouldn't even be allowed to be in business. Uh, and then, uh, what do you do for entertainment? Sir, what do you do for entertainment? Go out to eat. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of man. <laughs> and then... That's right. That's right. And so, sir... What did, tell me your spiritual story. Uh, I wasn't baptized until I was a junior in college. Junior in college. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a congregation uh, in Richmond. And my parents said they had already been a preacher to come to the city. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I tell you what, that's, uh, you'll hear a lot of, when you get their spiritual stories, it's when they start opening up to you the opportunity to get Bible study. Because they'll tell you all kinds of stories. I'm out of time. But uh, I want to do this real quick. We also have a package, and we're working on it more. But it's a package that you give them when they first come up out of the water. Here's a certificate of baptism. And uh, Jim, could you and Danny pass this out to everybody? Here's a congratulations list. And then here is the, uh, here's a letter that they write to Jesus. And you say, nobody's going to see this letter except you and Jesus. But we're going to write your name on it, put an envelope, and stick it in the church office. And if you ever just walk away from the Lord, we'll mail that letter back to you. And we will not have looked at it. It's just between you and Jesus. Well, I know a preacher in Florida that told me about this. He has an 80% retention level of new Christians because he threatens to send the letter back. <laughs> I thought that was a great idea. And then we give them the first copy of 50 Ways to Love the Father. And you can get this for your congregation as well. There's all kinds of things you can get. You can call, you can get a card from Jim before you leave, or do we pass those uh, things out for people to sign up? Okay, good. Thank you very much. And you the... Yeah, if you want another copy of the foundations to go practice on somebody or to use for a new Christian at home and try it, just help yourself. Before we go, let's have a word of prayer. Precious God and Father, we thank You so much for this day.
We thank you for the interest, Father, in keeping new Christians. Help us, Father, to do your will and to give you the glory for all things that we do. Because you're the one who gives the increase. And you're one, one Father, that can turn congregations of three and five and ten into congregations that are overflowing and busting out of the building. It all belongs to you. And so do we. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much.